Hello everyone. I am Rick Higgins, a SQL Server MVP and Solutions Architect with Scalability Experts. And today we are going to talk about SQL Server 2012 licensing twists. In other words, some, some things that I've learned over some recent engagements with some customers about how licensing in 2012 is occurring and some strategies you can take today uh, to help uh, get the most out of your licensing. So first of all, let's talk about some of the things that are different in SQL Server 2012. First thing to consider is that there is no more data center edition. The, the premium edition now is enterprise edition, as it was in SQL Server 2008. D data center edition only came out in SQL Server 2008 R2, uh, so there's no more data center edition. And the other big change is that it is now physical core based licensing. And I put a little note out there that says, well, it depends. And we'll discuss more about what that means um, in just a moment here. But let's talk about um, the ways you can license SQL Server today. And we're going to only focus on the three main additions that would necessarily be real issues for licensing. There are other additions such as Express and Developer and Web, but those are not licensing um, issues or concerns that you really have to deal with. So first of all, let's start, start with standard edition. Um, standard edition may be um, licensed under the server cow model or the core based model. Now server cow model means that your server has a license to run SQL Server and cow stands for client access license. So any device or any person that needs to access data that's on SQL Server must have a license in order to do so. So that's what the server cow model is. So um, a lot of organizations will have a server cow licensing agreement already in place so they can essentially uh, buy one server license and they have as many cows uh, for devices and users that they need. Um, now core based licensing means that you license each physical core on the server and you can have as many users connect. It doesn't matter if they have a cow or not. It's because you're on a what, what we call core based licensing. Now one thing to note is that standard edition enforces a upper limit of how many cores a SQL Server instance can see. That, and that number is 16. So if you need to access more than 16 cores, you're going to have to step up in additions. Now there's a new edition out called Business Intelligence Edition. And that, by design, is only available in a server cow model. It has everything the standard edition has in it, plus some extra business intelligence features that are not standard edition. That too is limited by 16 cores. Whether you're doing server cal or doing core based licensing, both of these additions are limited to 16 um, cores for licensing purposes. Now enterprise edition, there is no more server cal licensing model available. There is only core based. And I put a little asterisk there because if, if you have an, an agreement, an enterprise agreement, and a software assurance agreement with Microsoft that gives you upgrade rights, then you can upgrade that, your current licensing, to 2012. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But basically for new installations of SQL Server 2012, basically you buy core based. And there is no limit as to how many cores that you can access or present uh, to SQL Server on there. Uh, of course, you can only go up to as many as the operating system can present to SQL Server. So basically, Standard Edition has a great set of features. Business Intelligence includes everything in Standard Edition, plus some uh, other BI features. And Enterprise Edition includes everything. Core-based licensing is only for standard and enterprise. It's, it's the only option you have available. And standard edition and business intelligence edition may be licensed on a server cow basis. 
one of the things I wanted to mention about the Enterprise Edition for Server Cal, there is a grandfather clause, and we'll talk more about that in just a moment here, but that limits your Enterprise Edition Server Cal model to either covering up to four VMs, and those VMs can cover no more than uh, 20 logical processors or 20 threads uh, presented to it. If you have it running on bare metal, then it will only see up to 20 cores as well. So, so those are some of the um, limitations we have to deal with. So let's talk about some licensing bit basics. Many organizations have something called an enterprise agreement. It often refers to as EA or EAP, which is an enterprise agreement platform. But basically, it locks in price, pricing for a defined period of time, usually on the order of two, three, four years, and with designated true-ups. In other words, different checkpoints during that time where you see where you are in accordance to how much you thought you bought, and you make an adjustment at that time. Uh, usually, at the end of the agreement, there is another true up so that you pay for what you've been using. Now, SQL Server 2012's big licensing change is per core instead of per processor based. It used to be before 2012, for each socket, you had to license that on a per processor basis. It didn't matter how many cores you had. It was based on the physical socket on the motherboard. Um, but that's no longer the case. It's going to per core because you're getting into high core counts now, you know, 10, 12, even more cores per socket. So it, it, they really had to change the game in order to consider that. You can exchange your processor licenses for core licenses. Now, the default ra exchange ratio is four core licenses for each processor license. But you can get a better ratio uh, simply by having SQL Server running on a higher core box when you do your switchover at the end of your enterprise agreement. Now, Server Cal licensing is no longer available Enterprise Edition, but there is a limited, grant, limited grandfather clause that I mentioned in the previous slide. And there's no pathway currently from a Server Cal licensing model to a per proc or to a per core model. So you're going to have to talk to your Microsoft rep and uh, see if there is a pathway or not. Usually you have to buy brand new licenses for that. And also when you do buy SQL Server, you must buy a minimum of four core licenses and then go in pairs from up there. So you can't buy five licenses, you have to buy six. Not that you could buy a five core machine, but in any event, that's what you need to do. So let's talk about per core licensing and, and some things that you can do if you're already on an EA, an enterprise agreement. Um, let's say I have a situation here where I have SQL Server 2008 R2 licensed per processor on a server. And I have eight processor licenses to cover this, but each processor has eight cores. So I have, so really, really licensing 64 cores here. Now I upgrade to SQL Server 2012 licensing at the end of my EA, and now I have 64 core licenses. Now remember, if I didn't have the higher core count, my default exchange rate from a, from a per processor to a per core basis is four. So that means I only get 32 if I didn't have software assurance in my enterprise agreement to fall back on. Now, one thing to note is that any system that is internet facing must be licensed on a per processor or per core basis. So it, what I'm finding is that there are a lot of projects that are going on out there to give the customer more information from systems that they never had access to. So in other words, you have to think about, are these servers just going to stay internally facing, or are they going to be able to be serving up information to the internet? And that is one thing that um, you have to think about when thinking about which way of licensing I need to go. So let's talk about leveraging the uh, server cal licensing. So here I have a situation where I have some SQL Server 2008 um, RC licensing, which for, per, per server per cal VMs, and each enterprise edition server license allows me to cover up to four VMs 
and up to 20 logical processors. So in this first instance up here, where I have a server license covering four VMs here, this is legal here because I have 16, 17, 18, 20 logical processors that are presented to the, these VMs. So I'm good there. I'm good here. I have another enterprise edition server license covering two VMs. Each of them have eight virtual CPUs each or eight logical processors each at 16. I'm good there. I'm good here because I have enterprise edition server cal licensing covering four VMs and they're nowhere near that 20 logical processor limit. So as I go on and think about how I'm going to deploy this licensing on my servers, I think about in terms of VMs and also in terms of threads or logical processors or virtual CPUs that I am presenting uh, in each one of those VMs. Now, just a word about licensing at the virtual CPU level, because a lot of us are going into virtualization, and what does that mean? So you need a minimum of four core licenses per VM or any operating system environment, whether it's hard, hardware or software, you need four core licenses minimum. Each virtual CPU must be licensed within the VM, even if it is on a hyper-threaded enabled box. So even even though I'm presenting a not a real physical core, but a just a logical processor to that virtual CPU, I must license that virtual, virtual CPU, whether it's a real core or hyper-threaded core, if you will. And so you most likely will see this type of issue when you're dealing with standard and BI editions. Because with Enterprise Edition, if you licensed with Enterprise Edition at the host level, the bare metal level, if you will, buying processor licenses if you're still on your ODA, or core licenses if you're on your on new 2012 licensing, you get unlimited VMs. And you don't have to worry about those type of accounts. Um, also, we recommend if you are going into virtualization that you have a separate VM cluster, whether it's VMware or Hyper-V or whatever your hypervisor is. And there's really two main reasons, licensing and performance. Licensing first. If you're not licensing at the virtual CPU level on the guest VMs, any VM host that may host a SQL VM must be licensed at the host either by processor or by core in 2012 or by a sufficient number of server cal licenses with the parameters that we talked about. And you also need software assurance for mobility. So you can move those workloads, take advantage of vMotion and live migration to spread your um, workload over the various VM hosts accordingly. The second reason is performance. Many other applications run very well when you overcommit resources. If you just have a cluster just for SQL Server, whether it's Hyper-V or VMware, and you put in place some operational guidelines, such as minimal overcommit of resources, if any, prefer if no, none if possible, and also treat virtualization as a way to partition resources instead of sharing them. That is going to go a long way in giving you near-native performance as opposed to uh, incurring the overhead of virtualization. 